also um, flag potentially interesting uh, pedagogy events and information that I think would be of interest to Divinity School graduates. So do sign up for that list host. And it will be very occasional, I assure you. Um, and secondly, I wanted to note the final Craft of Teaching event of the winter quarter, which is the annual syllabus workshop. And this is a required component of the Craft of Teaching program, um, but space is limited and advanced registration is required. So um, please see our events page for information on how to register for that event. And finally, uh, I would ask you to keep a lookout for an updated event or a event listing for the spring. Uh, in particular, we will have our spring installment of the Craft of Teaching Seminar with our alumnus of the year, Michael Kenneman, and another April event that we're really excited about, a panel discussion with uh, 10 recent Divinity School alums um, who are returning to campus to talk about their experiences, their transitions from being graduate students into their first year of teaching. So there will be a, a panel discussion and a reception following, so it's an event that you won't want to miss, and there will be much more information about that forthcoming. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Mitchell. Thank you, Brandon. It's a distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker this afternoon, and I'm extremely grateful that Professor Jonathan Z. Smith accepted my invitation to come and give the Craft of Teaching seminar. Jonathan Z. Smith is Robert O. Anderson Distinguished Service Professor of the Humanities, also in the committees on the ancient Mediterranean world and on the history of culture and the college, associate faculty in the Divinity School in the area of history of religions. Jonathan Z. Smith is one of the foremost students of religion in our day. That's what you said. One night at dinner, you said, I prefer the title student of religion. Am I right? Oh, I was worried that I said about foremost. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Z. Smith says he is a student of religion. <laughs> I say he's a foremost student of religion in our day. I hope the air footnotes are clear. Um, uh, Jonathan Smith's uh, impact on the Guild of Religious Studies through his insistence on care with terms such as religion, demons, and others his concern with proper methodology, especially on the nature of a good, responsible, and fruitful comparison, and on conceptual apparatus for our field or fields. In particular, the use of taxonomy taken from the natural sciences. All of these things, in all of these things, his impact has been simply enormous. A magnificent essayist with the keenest possible eye for a great topic and for interconnections, Professor Smith is the author of books you all have read. Map is Not Territory, Imagining Religion from Babylon to Jonestown, to take place toward theory and ritual, Drudgery Divine on the comparison of early Christianities and the religions of late antiquity, and Relating Religion essays in the study of religion. This past year, the volume On Teaching Religion uh, of essays by Professor Smith, edited by his former student Christopher Larrick, has appeared from Oxford University Press. Among others is a classic essay that I think many here have read, and it's also on our website, among others, <laughs> Religious Studies, Whither and Why. If I can just say one personal note that um, when I came to graduate study um, in religion, I had been a high school teacher for three years. And what it means to be a high school teacher is basically to be taught how to teach in survey mode, to move very rapidly over a series of topics. And as I was complete, I had just finished my doctoral exams, I first heard Professor Smith on why survey teaching is deeply problematic and why it is far better to teach students to read one text deeply, thoroughly, and well. And from there, they can uh, gain exportable skills for a lifetime of learning. Um, I don't know if Jonathan knows that, but that's been formative for my own pedagogy throughout my career uh, as I continue to think about what it means to teach and to learn. 
So without further ado, I would ask all of you here at Swift Hall today to join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan C. Smith to the panel. I'll start by just saying something about uh, uh, syllabi, since I was asked to supply one. Presumably, that's something on your mind. Uh, I'm just old enough to have gone to college when you got two things from your professor. You got a syllabus and you got a reading list. And those are not the same things. They now are. A syllabus is an outline of the argument of the course. You still get those in Europe. In fact, you can get a verbatim transcript of lectures sometimes as the syllabus for the course. Then there's the reading list. By putting them together, I think we castrate both. But uh, we're an expert in hybrid genres uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, in my judgment, the syllabus is the most important piece of academic writing anyone does in the academic field. It's both a descriptive map of an area as you see it granted. It's both a descriptive map and an implicit at least argument. And I take it so seriously that for me it's the first primary text we read together in class is what the first day of class is spent on. It's the first topic of discussion that first day of class, uh, in which I try to account for the decisions I've made for what I didn't do and for what I did, and for why I think, but they'll have to decide there was a gain to the judgments that I underwent, so that I try to expose a syllabus as an implied argument, uh, something worth uh, thinking about. In particular, with this hybrid form, what was included and what was excluded. Now, obviously, much depends on the type of course. I've been privileged since I've been here, not only to teach for a while at the graduate level here at the Divinity School, uh, but for more than a decade now, spending my time mostly teaching in the college. And there one can teach uh, as part of a general education program, which I've done in the social science core, and there the syllabus is collectively uh, arrived at with no small weight of tradition behind it. Uh, in the winter, one always reads Durkheim. What else would one read in the winter? Uh, I suggested Freud since it's hotter, but uh, I didn't get anywhere with the weight of tradition. Uh, on the other hand, when I did uh, courses, two, two, two sets of courses that fulfilled the Western Civ requirement, uh, Bible and Western civilization, or Bibles, actually, since it had uh, the Quran and other texts, the Book of Mormon, uh, Bibles and Western civilization, uh, but then religions and Western civilization. One was freer, but one was still bound by the overall pedagogical reason for the college to privilege a particular course, such as a civilizational sequence. There are surveys in which subject matter governs what you do, uh, normally picking an area. Uh, there are courses I teach that I call basic structures, picking one or another, or in the case of the introductory syllabus, giving them all to you at once, uh, but uh, uh, looking at topics such as myth, such as ritual, uh, or a subset uh, that I happily gave on folklore. Uh, uh, a variety of, of topics. Classics in the study of religion, and there in particular, you incarnate the single book of, of principle. Uh, you read one book cover to cover, uh, and you read it together 
uh, with a class. And then the reading courses, honors papers, occasionally now still dissertation advising and so on, uh, a whole realm of arenas, uh, each one of which has not only its own rules, uh, but its own uh, uh, expectations, in which if you're not handing out a syllabus, you're preparing one mentally in your mind. Now let me say that I was a little reluctant to send you a syllabus because I learned early on that nobody can teach someone else's syllabus. Uh, when I started teaching uh, at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, as an acting assistant professor, step one, uh, because I didn't have my, my dissertation completed, in those days you could get a job without one, uh, but the pressure was on. And finally, it's the only time in 50 years that I've taken one, I uh, was given the lead for a quarter to finish the damned dissertation. And I was supposed to teach a course called Introduction to the New Testament, a uh, fairly standard uh, affair, and uh, they hired a, a graduate student of Dieter Betz's from, uh, from Claremont to come and substitute for me. And since his name happened to be Smith, the jerk simply handed out my syllabus. <laughs> and I got this desperate phone call after about the third week. He said, you know, the syllabus makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't understand why we're reading this passage in Paul and that passage in Mark and this passage. I, I don't know what, what, what. I said, well, why would you do that? I said, well, it was your course, so I thought I'd teach it. Well, I, I, I learned nobody can do that. And so you take this only, please, as a very rough sketch, not in any sort of, of sense of a model uh, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, emulated. Uh, a syllabus gives you a, a course title, and for me that's always been the first object of interrogation. Uh, it's, it's, it's easier if the topic is introduction to the New Testament, at least you can waggle one at them. Uh, harder if it's introduction to religion, because I have the foggiest idea what you waggle at them. Uh, and so you start. Uh, uh, your opening sentences, it seems to me, is to introduce the complexity that will bug us the entire course and will continue to bug us when we're finished if I've done my job right. Uh, what is this an introduction to? Religion? Religions? The study of religion? Those are almost incompatible uh, with one uh, an, an, another. What is it that I am introducing? Uh, and that obviously raises the question of definition, <laughs> with which we spend some time. Not only what is a definition, uh, that wonderful uh, that wonderful phrase of Edward Bellamy. Uh, it's uh, enclosing the wild with offense. <laughs> Uh, that is the important thing to me about definitions is they limit. They're not generous. They're not you all come. That's what screws up most definitions of religion. You hear about some funny something or other, you say, oh my God, I gotta change the definition to let the society of bootstrap lickers and worshipers into my definition. No, keep them out. Uh, uh, that's the job of definition. Get as few things as possible on the table, but let them be the best examples of the species that you can get on the table. So we spend time reading definitions. Uh, dictionary definitions of two types. General lexical dictionaries, in which my students learn, never except if you're on the debating team, quote Webster's, except to refute it. Uh, it says what everybody says the word means, and you're scholars now, and your job is not to use the word the way everybody uses it, but to use it for a particular purpose as a particular tool. So I don't want to hear about Webster's. So then the next thing we do is we look at specialized dictionaries, dictionaries of religion. There I must say the definitions are even worse than Webster's, but at least they have some key words in there. They know the problem, they just refuse uh, to speak uh, uh, to it. 
But that's then the topic, and that's what we're studying. We're going to try to, uh, to uh, uh, define our subject matter. That's the way we introduce something. And that means that I then shut up. And the next thing the class does is take, uh, in my kind of chronology, two cigarettes uh, to write a definition of religion. And if they have time of the study of religion, and I disappear and smoke my two cigarettes and come back in. And they've been told on the syllabus, because one of the things I always do with college students is tell them the final exam uh, the first day of class so that they can prepare. Uh, uh, they know that their final uh, paper, their only paper for the course, will be to revise that definition with specific reference to the materials we've read together in the course. So they begin to do what I began to do uh, within the first 15 minutes uh, that we're, that we're uh, uh, together. Uh, then uh, uh, one has to decide what can you give them to look at. And uh, beyond the, uh, beyond the, uh, uh, the definitions, uh, I want to give something that gives some sense of, I don't know what word to use, the ethos of the study of religion. And so I picked two chronologically simultaneous but attitudinally opposed documents. Uh, what I call the Emancipation Proclamation by the uh, IAHR, in which basically a scholar is to check their religion on the coat rack on the way in the door. Uh, it is the study of religion. We want no religious crap uh, within, uh, within the scholarly halls. And then the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, a uh, muddle-headed group of old farts, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, after coming out with their famous, you can't teach religion, you can only teach about religion uh, uh, under the Constitution, that spent basically most of the uh, 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 decision assuring everybody that they loved religion, was deeply committed to it, America was religious, there's nothing better than religion, God save the Queen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, of theology. Uh, uh, and, uh, so two quite different uh, arguments and with which, within which I would say uh, you could divide the class uh, of those who are there because they're curious but would, would, would probably hit you if you suggested they might be religious and those who were religious and wanted either to inquire further into their own tradition or to find out why the other kind of folks are wrong. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this gives them at least an articulate example of that argument, which is the repressed argument behind all arguments in the study of religion. Uh, it rears its head differently and under different disguises, but it remains. Then enough talking about it, we have to talk, begin to talk with it. And so the job, as you saw, was to uh, have them read primary texts, a fairly substantial uh, uh, primary uh, 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 texts, and one then needed a typology. And the simplest typology I could pick up that wasn't familiar, and there's a, 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 uh, an advantage at times to familiarity and at times to defamiliarization in the teaching of religion, uh, was to make it vary uh, by the social group. And so I had traditional religion, the polite word for primitive, uh, by which I meant religions that basically are ethnically constituted. You're born into it. Uh, and you can leave it, but you actually can't leave it. Uh, but if you're outside, you can't come in it. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a traditional uh, religion. Uh, as goes the king, so goes the country. Second category, imperial religion. And the third category, that which they all defined for me already as what religion is, associative religion. An individual matter, uh, a matter of choice, uh, a matter of inward disposition, uh, a matter of faith, and all that other junk. 
And uh, so uh, three types of religion, and we'll use those to organize the first uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, 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 course. Uh, their uh, own definitions were all associative. There wasn't an exception in the lot, regardless of the ethnicity and allegiance of the particular student. It's been constant for the 12 odd years I've had that particular uh, uh, exercise. One wants to uh, 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 insist, and uh, therefore one has to uh, lard one's examples uh, with uh, cases of it, that these are not three exclusive types. Very often one changes into the other. Uh, uh, very often uh, you'll find all, all of them simultaneously in any given culture. Uh, and so don't take them as, as, as hard-nosed categories but simply as a way of sorting the cards by suits uh, early on uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, game. Uh, we began then uh, with a set of uh, uh, texts in each case from a single cultural area, rather, whether it's defined as a rather small area or a rather uh, uh, large area, and the job was to, uh, uh, to read, and I gave you the example of the first one they had on traditional uh, uh, religions uh, from Kalimantan in my day, Borneo. And of course I picked it because when I was young, the wild man of Borneo was a trope you were all familiar with. Not only that, but you'd go to any circus or sideshow and you could see one. Uh, alas, it turns out, in the most cases, they are, in fact, autistic children uh, who have been uh, uh, exposed by their parents uh, for, uh, for uh, lucre. Uh, but nonetheless, it's reported, by the way, and that was the first time I actually thought about the wild man of Bordeaux as opposed to hearing about it when I was a kid. It's reported that when Fraser was a kid, he was taken to see the wild man of Bordeaux and ran out screaming. And one rather psychoanalytically inclined scholar has argued that that's the source of, of Fraser's not only fascination, but this mania to prove that primitives are ur scientists, that there's rationality there after all, that they weren't as frightening as little Jamie uh, thought. I think that's crap, but that's the, uh, uh, that's the argument. Uh, I took it uh, because uh, they were, for me, when I was a child, uh, the word Borneo went not only a wild man, but Dyak went with headhunting. Uh, there's over a hundred books entitled The Headhunters of Borneo or The Headhunting Dyaks of Borneo, and therefore they represent, in a way, the most primitive of the primitive. And so they're, they're a useful one to put on uh, the table. Then the best example that I know of uh, is uh, uh, the work of Shara, and that then raises several questions. First, the difference between, say, an ethnography, that is us telling us what they think, and a primary text produced by the tradition, where the tradition tells the members of the tradition what it thinks. And when you study anthropological examples, you're often dealing with us speaking for them. So it's worth some reflection on that. It's worth some reflection to not only say the author is Hans Schara, but the author is the very reverend Hans Schara. That is, he is a missionary. Uh, uh, and that doesn't automatically exclude him because it's usually the missionaries who have a consummate skill in the language. And that was the case. Uh, this is an oral, he's produced uh, the only Dyak texts until uh, recent times. So it gave us a chance to talk about not only anthropology <coughs> as an enterprise or ethnography as an enterprise, but also the missionary as an enterprise. And there are places. Uh, uh, what he talks about their supreme being being the Godhead, 
what suspects a bit of Germanic over translation. Uh, when he has the tree of life in there, I'm not exactly sure, but I want to come back to that one. I'm not exactly sure that was their word for it. But uh, on, on the whole, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important piece of work. What I also like is in 1999, a very bright young anthropologist uh, went and we studied this very group. So it's one of those rare cases where you can get uh, an updated ethnography of a specific group. Normally you don't poke somebody else's territory, and so this was useful. Then uh, there was what you saw uh, uh, locating these folk, uh, who my students had no knowledge of, and therefore not only locating them on a map, where the hell they are, uh, but locating them in space and time. And that uh, uh, produced a rather long narrative in this case, but you would all, I suspect, have been able, as they, I suspect, were not, uh, to decode what that was about. These are supremely historical people. They're not living in a vacuum. They have a history from the Stone Age to the present, and they have gone through a series of transformations and changes that absolutely boggle the imagination, including now declaring their religion a branch of Hinduism. Uh, so enormous, enormous change. Uh, uh, nobody is free from history, except maybe Iliadi, uh, but nobody else. Uh, everyone else is embedded up to their ears. Or as I also teach my students, everybody came from someplace else. And uh, nobody is at home. Uh, and therefore, let's not make a deal about culture contact. You can't be in a culture without contact. They're synonymous terms. They're not something that happens to a subset of, of culture. They're part of the nature of culture. So all this gets talked about uh, as we go through. And in fact, since I'm usually long-winded, it's talked about a little longer than I'm talking about it right, uh, right now. Secondly, however, uh, this is their text, it's memorized, uh, but we also have to be aware that these people, uh, uh, most strongly in the United States, uh, traditional religions take advantage of anthropologists' labors. They now have printed texts of their rituals. Uh, and so when this lady in 1999 interviews as it happens, Shara's prime uh, uh, informant, who is fortunately still alive, he's in the middle of selling for something, and he stops, and he can't remember the line. Uh, this is a text that takes some 18 hours to recite. He can't remember what line. He excuses himself, runs in, comes back with Shara's book, which is printed in the Daju on one side of the page in German, which you can't read on the other side, finds the line, quotes it to her, and happily puts it back, and continues to open his eyes shut, beating the drum to recite the text. Okay, so, uh, 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 one is not only studying their religion, one is producing their Bibles, one is producing their religious texts. Uh, those green volumes that Levi Strauss adores of the Bureau of American Ethnography are the prayer books of group after group after group in the United States who perform their rituals by the instructions written in the ethnographic, uh, ethnographic uh, 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 reports. Uh, this obviously is set up, if you look at the syllabus, the next thing we do is go to imperial religion and we go to the loquacious Near East. Nobody scribbles as much as the Near East. And so you have the people who don't write and the people who write. And, and is that an important difference? And it's worth talking about. And the texts were chosen in part to allow you to see formulaicness in the oral uh, to see references to other documents in the written, and, uh, and uh, 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 so on. Now there is also built in here uh, what I call time bombs. Uh, I've left them in because they will lead some students to make mistakes. And uh, since they write about each reading for me, 
uh, I'll, I'll find uh, those mistakes and be able to work on them. Uh, for example, this one was innocent. I did not know on the front page of the handout that you read on the uh, on uh, uh, traditional religions that this article on uh, 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 peyote would produce such enormous indignation among my students. The notion that a religion wouldn't let you in because you're not a Native American was absolutely horrific to them. I mean, you should have seen the indignation. Uh, and each time, there's practically a riot in the classroom that they read this, they get furious about it. That's how seriously we take the associative character of religion. It's, it's your choice. What do you mean it's their choice? Uh, uh, it's, it, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's why Augusta can, until recently, not let women in. In the eyes of the Supreme Court, a religion is like a private club. It's allowed to exclude. That's the Boy Scout decision. It's allowed to exclude those who it wishes to exclude. I don't particularly hold out for the genius of that argument, but let's let's let it roll. Anyway, I didn't I didn't expect that. Second time bomb, I asked them right away. In fact, after they uh, looked at this syllabus. Uh, I like Sam Gill's uh, definition, which is why I chose to quote it, but what would you revise in it on the basis of your reading? And what I hope they would revise is the sentence that these, they were largely uninfluenced by the cultures of Europe and of Asia, because the deep influence of both uh, India and China upon uh, uh, the cultures of Borneo or Kalimantan uh, uh, were emphasized in the in the reading and uh, and so on. Third, and I don't know because I can't read the Gaju. I, I I don't know if it's a proper translation or not, but it doesn't matter for the point I want to make. Uh, there'll always be eight or nine students absolutely thrilled to find a tree of life in a garden in the middle of this Nagaju text. And not only that, but man and woman are created next to that tree of life. And they're absolutely thrilled. There's nothing more exciting to a student. Most of us are attra were attracted to the fields we're in because of the differences in religion. Most of the college students are attracted to looking for similarities. And there's some sense of triumph See, we influence them too, or something. I don't know what the hell it is. But they're all excited about it. And you stop and you say, now just a goddamn minute. <laughs> this is a tree with its roots. It's, it's, it's Iliadi's tree. It's got its roots in its underworld, and the crown's in the underworld, its trunk is in this world. It, it's not that dinky little Genesis tree. It's just a little old tree. Uh, this thing is, uh, you know, the Empire State Building is warped by comparison. Secondly, did you really pay attention? I know, I know it's where they created man and woman, but how did they create man and woman? No, no, come on, tell me, how the hell did they create man and woman? Well, you see, these two hornbills were fighting with one another. They're the divinities, you know, Mr. Smith. I said, oh, well, Jesus, kind of reading like Genesis now. And these two hornbills are whacking at each other with their horns. Uh, you know, why would you have a horn? And one accidentally knocks off a little bit of moss from the trunk of the tree, and out of that, males come. And the other one accidentally whacks off a little mushroom from the tree, and out of that, female comes. I mean, we got a strong parallel there. I mean, I charge plagiarism. Uh, but I know they're going to fall for it every damn time. And so it's in there, uh, in part at least, uh, for that sort of uh, reason. The second half, uh, and I can be much, much briefer on this, the second half uh, is the one that forces comparison. The first half, I hope you'll compare between those three types. 
But nothing that I do makes it inescapable for you to do it. The second part of the course is constructed around fundamental structures in religion, myth, ritual, sacred uh, persons, and so on, uh, rites of passage. And in each case, they have a set of reading of snippets, of small pieces of text, drawn from all three religious types. And so therefore, they can't talk with any authority about the culture and leave it all embedded there. They've got to compare through the different cultures. And what can they compare to the only thing possible to the type? And uh, uh, so it, 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 it gets them into, uh, into uh, that uh, mode of reading. Uh, beyond that, I think the only other thing is I really want to hear from you that I want to say is that uh, I chose for the Diax a very long text. It's about 50 pages. I, uh, because I pay for the Xeroxing, uh, reduce it down like this. So it's five columns of minuscule writing, and there's about 12 or 14 pages of this to read. Uh, I do this in part because right here is Shara's summary of the myth, of this whole huge thing. And I have them look at that. Because what I want to remind them of is anthropological convention, look at Lady Strauss. Almost all myths you will ever read in texts that are not folkloristic or archival in nature is that kind of summary. So when you read that kind of summary that you read now in two minutes, behind it is this enormous thing that you've slugged through if you stuck with it for hours. And it seems to me an important point uh, 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 to make. So that's maybe I think all I want to say uh, uh, about the materials that you uh, that you had a look at. I flew three of my outlines, so let me make you yeah, it close enough. Uh, so let me hear from you, please. Okay, the floor is open. Floor for uh, questions and comments. Dive in. choice one can make. Uh, that is, it's, if, if I was teaching an introduction to the study of religion, I would, I would, I would uh, uh, focus on that. Problem is that I would read no primary text. If I do an introduction to religion, which is how I understand this course, uh, I give you primary text. I sneak in other people. I get a bibliography with each one of these topics, and I get to see names recurring, and I'll say something about um, Van Gennep on this, Eliade on that, uh, Bruce, uh, 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 I lost, I lost my example. Uh, Bruce Lincoln is who I was after. Uh, Bruce on this one, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, no, I, uh, I, I don't think, if I have only one course to teach, and that's the way I look at this, uh, it's one day, of teaching time. It's less than a 24-hour day. I got one day, what am I, how am I going to spend it? I'd rather than look at the stuff than look at the theories. Now, I also teach courses on theories, and uh, I teach courses on individual theorists uh, in the college. But that's not to me what to do the first time. The majority of these students, this is their first and only course they're going to take in religion. Less than one day. That's the one, that's the figure that haunts me. Less than one day. Less than 24 hours. They have. Uh, and so no, I don't. I don't do that excepting directly. No. Uh, 
Uh, you said that by putting a book list and a syllabus together, you, you castrate them both. Can you say a little bit more about that, and, and what's a different way of presenting those two texts? Yeah, I, I, I basically think one, I've got an example of it, in fact, printed here, uh, where uh, you, uh, you, you have the readings as one list, and that's the efficient list. Uh, and then you have a, a, a statement, what is a little bit of what you've just heard from me. You have a statement about what the payoff of reading that is, what to look for, why is it important, what is it led to. Uh, that is, you have a set of, uh, uh, of arguments, of reflections, uh, on hope for results of the reading. So it's the logic of the reading, if you want, along with the reading. And uh, I find it, uh, uh, if your syllabus gets really long, it will not be looked at at all. So uh, 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 the combination means about a 12-page document, and they're not likely to look at it. Uh, so I think that's what, that's what, uh, that's what happens. I myself uh, wish we would go back to handing out two documents. Uh, the efficient document, if you want, uh, for those who simply want to know what they're supposed to read for the next day, uh, and the more think PC uh, 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 sort of document. I think it would be helpful. It's more helpful than those catalog descriptions. So, uh, uh, yeah. that's not a peculiar problem to religions. To any subject, people come in with their own take. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say two, two, two or three quite different things. One, it's not always easy to find out about the take. So you have to try some multiple ways of, of finding it. Uh, uh, time for questions. Uh, uh, writing on every assignment. Uh, where uh, uh, sooner or later they're going to get fatigued and they're going to tell me what's really on their mind. And uh, I, 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 that's great help to me. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's anything particularly special about that. Uh, and I don't think our job is necessarily, by the way, to look root that either. Uh, 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 our job is to say, but have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Uh, someone else to take that symbol and see something very different in it. Has you thought of that? Uh, has some people in the tradition that you're familiar with? Because I would want to, I would want to limit the imagination of people on the tree of life in Western tradition. Uh, do you, do you, are, have someone have, have they come up with something like that? And then yes, you can find cosmic trees. Uh, or, Certainly in Romanian material, which Richard has with all the time. So yeah, uh, I uh, I don't think that's a special problem. I, I think it's a problem for you of your patience with it, and, and I mean that not because the subject makes you impatient but because you hear it so many times and it's so goddamn unimaginative when you hear it. And you have to be, I think, patient with it. And you try to say, look, uh, internal 
to any tradition that's worth being called a tradition is variation, disagreement, and so on. So multiple interpretations are present within any of those traditions. And I'm sure there's a point at which we can find a contact between some understanding over there and some understanding over here. What you don't want to do is draw global conclusions from that. You want to draw very modest conclusions from it. But that human imagination goes to work on these these texts, these traditions, uh, and not in radically different ways. Different, but not radically different ways, it seems to me one sort of takes for granted. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit then about what happens during the kind of class meets for a class like this, especially because I think it says on here that there's 142 students, so how, what happens during the class time? What happens during the class time is what happens to any course that I think of as an introduction. That is, I do a lot of talking. Uh, to me, an introduction has an introducer. And my job is to introduce. My job, secondly, is not to wait for the odd and assorted question. But often than not is usually a reaction to something just said, which is not very helpful. But you have to find ways of, of, of instigating a conversation. My way of instigating it is by getting those statements from them for every reading and getting it before the second session on that reading, which means I can say a number of you thought and so would someone please explain that to me? Or, you miss so-and-so said, could you explain that to me? All right? Or something of that sort. So that to me, the idea of having uh, weekly writing, outside of getting people in the habit of writing, uh, is to give me some raw material to target uh, the kind of questions I'd like us to ask, which are not necessarily the questions I'm going to get asked. Then one tries to be available before and after. They know where I am before, they know where I am after. Um, yeah. uh, there are other kinds of classes. Clearly, you have 12 of us sitting around the table uh, uh, reading E.B. Tyler if we can stay awake, is a very different formula, formula than, than this sort of thing. Yeah? yeah I'm curious. It's, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And there's, a, there's not only the choice of what you teach, but who you teach. And I'm curious, as an educator, what do you feel are the benefits and drawbacks of teaching low-level undergraduates or maybe just undergraduates in general versus graduate students. What effect do you hope to have with them with the time as an educator with those students down the road, in terms of big picture? Well, I've, in all due respect, have always been fairly clear about my choice, which is to teach college students and to get them in the first two years. I'm not interested in majors. Uh, that already, to me, is the end. Uh, <laughs> it's getting bored. Uh, and uh, yeah, what I want is a few moments of their time so that as they go on into things that I can't even imagine, every now and then something will hit them and they'll give me another few moments of their time. I guess that's what I, that, that's what I see it as. I don't want to train anybody for something. I, I really don't like that role. I've played it, but I don't like it. Uh, I really want to uh, enable interesting gossip. <laughs> That's my idea. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, 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 I want them to have, uh, unfortunately, actually, religion is, a, is, is, is not a, is not a uh, 
a rare topic of conversation. Uh, so I'd like to have some impact on that conversation. And I think that would make me very happy. To follow up, could you give a concrete success story, of, for example, of, of a student you had as a low-level undergrad where you've heard about something you've done and you just thought that was a great success story? Yeah, I'll give you an example of a student I had from college through a PhD from the Divinity School. So uh, many, many, many years. And uh, she's now a, uh, an expert in information retrieval. I don't even know what it is. Uh, I don't use a computer. I have no understanding of that world and wish not to have any understanding of that world. <laughs> And she sends me her publications, and I read them faithfully. I don't have bodies of what the hell she's talking about. <laughs> and I see, as I read them, suddenly, classification, big deal about it, all, all into this stuff. And then she's talking at one point about comparing. Now, she's not comparing anything I compare, but she's comparing. And I, I see her talking about comparing is not just like. Comparing is I said, oh, we, we, we got somewhere. Thank you, Carol. It's been <laughs> worth it. One of them makes it worth it, frankly. It's a very haphazard business. <laughs> I, mean, I describe it as shooting BBs into a bowl of jello. <laughs> Sometimes there's resistance and it stops. Most of the time it squirts right through. And uh, that's what it's like. And uh, so uh, a couple like that is enough to, to make it feel worthwhile. Yeah. But that's what you're trying to do, I think. You're trying to inform general discourse. That's where I link education to civics and all of those other things. That's when I say it's a political act, by that I to tell me what Bruce means, I mean it's an act of making a decision. That the one thing we don't tolerate is no decision. The one thing I, I said is the one thing that I praise most as someone predisposed not to praise it at all about professional education, because one thing it tells you is no matter how complex, you've got to reach a decision. And uh, trains you in the decision. Right? We can't have a surgeon abstaining in the middle of things. So, uh, uh, and what ideally what makes a decision is discourse, an intelligent discourse. So that's what I think is what one tries to do. I would gladly teach another subject. I have no particular investment in the subject of teaching religion. I might have been much happier uh, teaching something else. But uh, uh, the, here's, what, here's where I am. You know, I'm not going to say God help me. I can do no other. But uh, uh, here's, here's, here's where the, you know, the dice got thrown. And it's OK, because I would do the same thing in something that I feel more comfortable with. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that part of your practice in the first day of class is to sort of justify your syllabus to explain what you have chosen to include and also what you've chosen to exclude. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what you take to be um, the excluded on this syllabus, right? what you didn't include. Theology is the biggest single exclusion. Um, that is, I, and it, it's 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 the failure of the course. Uh, to me, the most interesting part of religion is studying native reinterpretation of it. So that's that's where. I had a field day with a year-long course on the Bible because all I basically taught was reinterpretation from, you know, from Ur to the Book of Mormon. Uh, and uh, uh, I loved it. I have not, and I tell the students this, it's the greatest single failure of this course. I'm going to tell you they're priests, but I'm not going to tell you they're learning. 
and and it's the it's that side of it, the updating of tradition, the working of tradition, the absorption of novelty, the saying you're saying the same thing when you're never saying the same thing, all that. So the bakery of tradition and the genius of tradition, uh, and that's the part I have to leave out. I can't see a way of sticking it in. I really can't. I, I, I've I've uh, I've had uh, there are occasional readings, uh, the one on uh, the one on the end of the world because it, it's interesting. Everyone talks about myth and almost always wants to talk about the beginning of the world. And the end of the world is, is never one of the first things you tell me when you tell me what a myth is. And so I took the end of the world. And there you can uh, 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 pick up a little sense in the readings on that because the. Because Daniel stands behind the Jewish, the Christian, and the Islamic uh, uh, passages we're reading, you can see Daniel rearing his head out of the sea. Uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, in in any of that's the only time where it comes up explicitly. Uh, so I think one of the things that keeps religion alive, and my language was lying about it. That's what keeps it alive. We've always believed this, hell yeah. Uh, we've never believed that, the hell yeah. Uh, but lying about it, uh, this is what this text means. You know. uh, but that's, well, that's the lifeblood of religion. So it changes all the time, and it would die rather than admit it changes. It's the only phenomenon I know that's quite like that. Most of the time, we'd love to say we've changed. Where would science be if we can and now thought we only we used to think that? We don't think that anymore. Our sense is we've always thought that, right? And that's the part I leave out. So to me, the dynamic of religion, I don't teach in this course. I over, I have to say, my students will tell you, I overcompensate for that in some of the other courses I teach. One student wrote in the evaluation of the Bible course, isn't there anything but interpretation? And I wrote, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, not in this course. So, yeah, that's the biggest thing we, 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 uh, we, we like. Uh, and then we like the sort of systematic articulation, unless you're prepared, that's what I meant by theology. Unless you are willing to take a myth as in some sense a systematic interpretation, the problem is it's an implicit system, and this is not the audience to, to get that implicit system out of, of, of the myth. Uh, so I miss, uh, uh, so for me what I really miss, and it bothers me, but I don't know in one quarter, ten weeks, uh, how, to, how to correct for it, is what I would call the thoughtful part of religion. Uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't mean that what we're looking at is the irrational part, but it's not that now I will sit down and think about this side of it. And, and that is not there in this course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can come up with such a, a, a well-crafted syllabus uh, at a late stage of your career and have great confidence in it. But when you're starting out as a scholar and let's say you're teaching your first class and you don't have this breadth and depth and that confidence and knowledge, how do you go about uh, coming up uh, with the syllabus, drafting, or choosing and excluding feelings? Um. Well, actually, you should watch me do it, because you wouldn't see a lot of confidence. Uh, there's crumpled paper all over the floor. And uh, I wrote a little piece, the opening piece of this, that I gave here at Swift Hall. I forget what, I'm approaching a college classroom. And I thought a little bit about the practical side of things. I keep notebooks. Don't let any idea you had get lost. Uh, as soon as you finish, go back and revise what worked, what didn't work, and so on. But that doesn't answer your question, which is how you do it the first time. You 
imitate. You imitate. You think of some class you had where something worked. You think of something like that something that worked in that class. And you, you build out from there. You ask advice. <laughs> You go and look at, you pull out the syllabi you have from other classes you've taken. Uh, there's no manual on how to write a syllabus. Uh, a syllabus is a funny thing. It's a very personal statement in a very formal format. Uh, and so it's really an odd, an odd genre. And uh, I find uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, even if I've taught the same, or roughly the same syllabus for years, I still have to think it through each year and go back over what worked and didn't work and decide if what didn't work was fatal enough that I really need to change it. And that means that you keep a kind of a running diary of what you're doing. You, you don't let all that way, all the work you put in go to waste. It does get easier because you slip into habit. And so it's very nice every now and then is to have that habit destroyed to do something different. I mean, it's, it's very important uh, to recover that insecurity. But I would say you've had models, uh, you've had things that you've seen work and not work. Uh, you can come up with analogs uh, 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 to them. Uh, of course, many teachers, not just beginning teachers, uh, do the uh, Well, go the road of scoundrels. I was trying to figure a nice word and I couldn't think of it. That is, they use a textbook. And of either kind, the textbook, which is like me, just doesn't, doesn't stop talking and talks its subject through, or a reader, an anthology of some sort. So someone else has made that, but now what you have to do is retroactively You'll be like that poor Mr. Smith who called me. Why the hell did he put that reading in? All right? But there is that other route. I don't like it because it seems to me you, your investment in that course is not there. I, 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 I very much think of this as my course. I wouldn't like someone else to teach that syllabus. I was quite in notion sometimes people are, but I, I wouldn't like somebody to. It's mine. Uh, yet I, uh, I have to say I start off each year with a blank piece of paper and think it through again. And there have been changes uh, over the years in this. Going. I, I see a hand, I can't see who's with it, but there's a hand way in the back near a window. Well, that's where I'm curious because you explain uh, very engagingly about a course that seems to be called Introduction to Religion, and yet the syllabus says Introduction to Religious Studies. Yeah, I can't help it. They gave me the title. That's an administrative artifact. Is that something that you work at all in the, in the course at all, that discussion? Uh, I talk about the difference between them, yes, and, and tell them why I don't call the course that. But they call the course that, and since it fulfills a requirement, I guess I got to call the damn course that too. <laughs> and I think that's because the program is called religious study, so this is now an introduction to not just to the study of religion, but an introduction to a program called religious studies. And I take it that's the way I would defend the logic of it. Uh, but. Uh, See, I get into your issue. If I, if I really said this is a cross on the study of religion, then I'm flipped right away to the theoretical, to the methodological, and so on. And that's not what I want to do in this particular course. Along similar lines, um, I appreciated your comments on never teaching somebody else's syllabus. What are some strategies for making a syllabus one's own if there are institutional expectations, not only on the title of the course, but on specific contents or on format of the courses that you're there to teach, especially as a new, uh, new member of faculty? Uh, bow down to the wind. <laughs> it's not worth the job. Uh, I uh, 
certainly taught, taught a course my first teaching, with which I profoundly and utterly disagree. Uh, I thought it was stupid. I still think it's stupid. The chairman of the, of the department also wrote the book we use, which I think is stupid. Uh, and I crossed my fingers and taught like a demon. called the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I said the only interesting part of that title is the hyphen. <laughs> and I only said it the last day of class. <laughs> Folks, or gentlemen, since it was a Dartmouth, we spent a whole goddamn semester studying a hyphen. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, but that does happen. If that happens, uh, it's not for them, but we can come on. Uh, I, what I would say is that when they have those things, we have them here. Uh, and if they work, then they're, they're okay. Uh, uh, and that is a course that really is a staff course. Uh, there's really a couple of people, uh, or some of them there's rather big, 15 or 20 people, uh, and in some sense, that course is a reflective judgment. Now, as you get added to it, you've clearly got a template that's there, and you're going to argue like hell to move a beloved reading. But you can make that argument, and I've seen them. I mean, I saw uh, Vic Turner jump for Lady Strauss. Vic's a lot easier to teach. Boring in the long run, but a lot easier to teach. And scaring the kids with the play the Strauss, but that's the way they wanted it. Uh, so I have no implicit objection to teaching an effect than somebody else's syllabus. Uh, if it's collective and if we have a chance to, this has a weekly staff meeting in which we can all post mortem how it's working, and, and, and that's okay, it seems to me. Even though I admit over the years that tends to get, to do something I don't usually like to use, but use the word ritual pejoratively, that tends to be an empty ritual. Um, uh, you gossip more than you fundamentally argue about the issues of interpretation of that passage in Freud. Um, um, But uh, I, 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 yes, one very often is handed a syllabus. Oh, one very often has a job which is a replacement, like this poor guy had. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes you, yeah, I, I, I think in principle it doesn't work because I think so much of you is writ into those, those syllabi. Talking about something that's practice, how do you um, how do you sort of bring that alive despite the fact that you're giving it to your students on paper? I can't. Uh, I, I really I mean you 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 can't. Movies don't work. Uh, I can only I can only do it with offhand remarks. But they've all seen ceremonial occasions. They've all seen ritual. They've all done these sort of things. And so you just remind them that, that we're reading a third-hand description of something. Uh, there are people who are doing it firsthand. Uh, but short of that, but that's, you see, it seems to me that dilemma is part of the dilemma of the study of religion. The study of religion in, presupposes some measure, we can argue about the yardage, but some measure of distance. And some measure of distance means it's not enabled alive and so forth in front of you. It's not quite in a biologist's jug of formaldehyde, but it's closer to that than it is to living. Okay? Because we fixed it. And 
we fix the moment of it, or we fix the very abstraction, which isn't even a moment of it, so that uh, you can't really do that. And field trips and all that, 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 we're in college now, we're not in high school anymore, so the hell with that. Uh, uh, but many of them have a very keen sense of it, and again, they, they will talk about it. It will inform some of what they do. But I don't think we can do much more than that, myself at least. Now, partly that's my nature. Uh, I prefer to read above every, anything else in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't want to experience, I want to read. I want to have experience, someone's experience that's printed. That's, that's my idea of a hot time in the old town. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm very comfortable with this, with this dilemma, but I do recognize from some of my colleagues, especially some of my younger colleagues, the dilemma, when this has become, in fact, more of a front and center issue. When I was trained, one never read anybody who was alive. That was the first sign you were a graduate student. <laughs> Couldn't be alive. How could they be worth reading if they were alive? Until moss is on the stone, they're, they're not worth reading. Now I know experiential learning is a term of art. Okay? So uh, the world has turned. And uh, I'm an old phobia. On that one, among others. <laughs> yes? You mentioned that uh, you assign weekly writing exercises, and then there's a final paper, and then you also have a journal. Um, no, what, what you're I, I I urge them to keep a reading journal. I don't see that. What I see are what I call questions and observations on the readings. And those they hand in to me, they're not graded. How the hell would I grade them? The fact that they're handed in is great. That is, uh, uh, I'll penalize you if you don't hand them in regularly and on time. Uh, and since I read them all and I use them, I construct what we do in class very much out of them. Uh, Sometimes with name credit, sometimes without. Uh, but I get that every week. So I get 10 of those uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the course of this course. And then their paper actually should be able to be written out of those because the paper simply asks them to take, after all, to interpret something that they themselves wrote but now evaluated in light of the things that we have, have read. Uh, uh, and so obviously, I mean, just right off the top of the bat from the way the course is, is organized, uh, uh, that religion is a matter of free choice is going to go from some people's, some people's definitions of religion. Some people actually had it in the definition. Uh, uh, a lot of talk now because it's in the news about freedom of religion. And the idea that religion and freedom are inextricably melded together is, a, first of all, a very odd and peculiar idea given history, uh, but one that I wouldn't let into a definition of religion. Religion is freedom? Hell it is. Uh, it's coercion. Uh, so, uh, But I hope they have a journal because I don't want them, for instance, to give me an outline of what they read, but it might not be a bad idea to try to make an outline. Uh, I, uh, I don't necessarily want to hear that they think this text is boring and all of that. They may want to remind themselves that never read that damn thing again. Uh, so I, 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 I'm perfectly happy that there be another mode of writing that I don't look at. You see, let me say this, because I've written about this, and it's, it's, it's to me the greatest problem a teacher faces. Uh, <clears throat> I know how a student writes. I don't know how they read. And I'm persuaded that if they read badly, they write badly. 
they read well, they sometimes write badly too, but uh, I, I don't know how they read. Uh, when I was younger and more ambitious when I would teach in the core, I would call in their, 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 their books, I'd have them given to me. And I'd go home and study how they underlined. Uh, fascinating how they underlined, by the way. Uh, one who had a black schmira and obliterated everything on the page she thought was not important. The only thing that was left. What would be a doctor get? Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and I couldn't understand what she left. I think I wrote about this one. She erased all of Durkheim's, just his opinion, and left only the facts. The Australian eats a woodfield girl. That was there. <laughs> this is a total of the <laughs> That was gone. So, uh, old, uh, just the facts, man, was left. It was, it was worth its weight in gold to find out that's how that soul was reading. Uh, and so it was fascinating to me. Uh, it also took an awful lot of time, particularly when you meet with each one of them about the readings that they, that they did. Uh, but it's a great frustration how they read. So anything that gives you a modest clue as to how they might be reading, Here's someone who clearly is going to read for biblical parallels all the way through, so I better try to say something about that before this gets completely out of hand. Or someone else thinks that's a good idea, since I'm not grading these things, I didn't say she was wrong. And uh, so that, yeah. Yes, yes there was something about two-thirds of the way back. Yeah. Is it? And if it is, why is it important for religion to be taught? It's no more important than any other subject to be taught. But it's an active force in the world we live in, and uh, has been an active force in the world we inherited, and as such is worth some thinking. I wouldn't make much more plea for it than that. Uh, it's got a place on the landscape. It's never been a minor place on the landscape. And uh, so some knowledge of it. And I suppose I would want to say, in the context of education, some knowledge at least that not everyone's work like the one you may be most familiar with. That there's difference and that's supportable. That's okay. Uh, uh, I think is, uh, is uh, what's useful. Uh, we've been through phases. It is interesting. Uh, I, 20 years ago, my sense is it was very much an antiquarian subject. You had, a, you had to work as a teacher very hard to persuade people that religion was a visible part of the world we live in today. And that was part of your job as a teacher. Part of job Nazis was to shut the windows already. Uh, 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 it's pouring at you from all over the place, and it looks almost incomprehensible because there's so damn much of it. There's too much static. And uh, so now the job is in a way to try to not dwell on all the minutia, but try to step back a little bit from, from all of that. But the mood has certainly changed. The religion is a taken for granted topic. It seems to be for most of our students today, not only students here, I mean students in the wider sense of the word. And I think it was very much not a taken for granted subject uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, say more about your approach, uh, approaches specific to discussion-based classes, whether uh, general education classes or uh, seminars on particular topics? 
I've always, I've never trusted, except when John Cage does it, I've never trusted spontaneity. So uh, there's always a designated person to start our conversation off. And I have to have someone out there that I can count on. Uh, who I know have read it, because the wrath of God is going to get them if they haven't, and uh, has come in with something prepared to set us off with. And so uh, it's always been a instigated discussion, uh, never a free-for-all. Uh, and uh, I've done that in, uh, in even some of the very large classes. Uh, in, in the Bible class, uh, there would be a designated role. And I pretend they were the only people in the class. And I would talk to them and ask some questions. And this, next, next, next class, another people, another set of 10. That's how you can take 150, 200 students and still at least have one, one discussion with, 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 with them. I learned that from a footnote in the Harvard Curriculum Committee report. <laughs> they also uh, had, had another suggestion, which is another way of, of, of provoking discussion, which is that uh, take five minutes at the end of each class to say, write out for me, uh, what was the most interesting thing you learned today, and what do you wish we had, we had discussed? And then start the next class by reflecting on those. Uh, and uh, I must say, some of the blue my I mean, sometimes they're fooling around. Where do you buy your ties and who does your hair, Mr. Smith? Well, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and you're a college teacher, so okay, ha uh ha. -huh. Uh, God forbid you're not, you know, one of the guys. But uh, it settles down pretty fast. And uh, the questions are extremely good. And so now I'm asking them their questions. I'm not asking them my questions. And that uh, makes a big difference, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, I try to uh, I try to leave it not just potluck. Once it gets going, it's potluck, obviously. I mean, you can't sit there and you know, program the same. But, uh, uh, for a course that is primarily a discussion course, uh, there's always a device of some sort. Because there are no such things as discussion classes. Every seminar I've ever observed as I walk down the hall, there are four loud mouths and everyone else is quietly listening. There are four incompetent lectures in every seminar class. That's what it is. And so, you might as well spread the incompetence around, is my judgment, and make sure everybody gets a chance to be publicly incompetent. <laughs> I was going to also ask about your use of humor in your class. <laughs> I try to be very serious all the time. Oh my God. Do I remember the right hand, Elaine? No, it's not. Is this the right hand? Oh, this is the right hand. So help me, God. Well, I think that's a, a very good note to, uh, to move the conversation um, over to refreshments. I think, among other things, um, you have enabled this group here to be much more interesting in their gossip uh, about uh, teaching uh, of the study of religion. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Smith.